Well, hi everyone. My name is Miriam Risby and I'm one of the members of the Virtual Shadowing Working Group. Welcome to our sixth virtual shadowing session. Uh, we're excited to have you guys here and we have a really interesting topic today. Tonight we're going to be talking about the emergency medicine specialty, tactical medicine, and SWAT support. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind everyone that we send out weekly emails every Wednesday and Sunday with announcements and access to our Zoom links. Please be sure to check your spam folder and promotions tab on Gmail on those days for emails from us or by searching the phrase virtual shadowing in our uh, in our in your email search bar. Uh, to sign up order? or to learn more about the program, please visit us. I don't know. I thought we were like eat in. Um, right, okay. would you once again mute everyone, Yo, I'm, please? I'm in the virtual shadowing room. Okay. Uh, to sign up for our mailing list or to learn more about our program, please visit us at www.virtualshadowing.com. All right, so here's our team that makes the magic happen, uh, the Virtual Shadowing Working Group. We have Reagan, Shayan, Taylor, Elena, Rachel, Aniruth, myself, and of course, Dr. Fowler. Our guest speaker today and someone who has been a huge part of our previous sessions too um, is Dr. Merchetti. And I believe that we'll be having questions uh, in the middle of the session, Miriam. Um, um, these are the upcoming sessions. I'll come to the questions in a moment. The upcoming session, folks, please save your dates. Uh, right now we have Zoom for 1,000 and currently we're at almost 900. So it looks like it's pretty popular. Uh, on July 14th, we will have an outstanding speaker who's one of the um, associate professors of emergency medicine at UT Southwestern, who was number one in her class in medical school, who does medical school clerkships. And so this will be a study in what you can expect on medical school clerkship rotations. We'll then be talking next about ultrasound in emergency medicine, which is the future of not just three-dimensional, but four-dimensional anatomy that you will have to learn if you are going to be a physician in the 21st century. On July 28th, we're gonna do a specialty spotlight. A fourth of our folks who come to see us on virtual shadowing are physician assistant or pre-PAs. And so we will do family medicine with a focus on the PA in family medicine. On August the 4th, Dr. Pierce will join us uh, who's an emergency doc at UT Southwestern and is one of the true national bright lights on diversity in medicine, a talk that you will really enjoy. She's also on the admissions committee uh, of UT Southwestern. On August 11th, Dr. Pam Okada will join us. She is a pediatric emergency physician and pediatrician uh, at UT Southwestern and Children's Medical Center, and she will be talking to us about pediatric emergency medicine. Uh, next slide. Uh, um, we, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mary. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to remind you guys to post uh, questions in the chat as we go along. Uh, the working group and I will be taking note of every question so that they can be presented to Dr. Marchetti during the Q&A panels. There will be uh, two Q&A sessions, one about halfway through the session and one at the very end. If you have any questions about the assessment, please save them for after we announce the quiz information, which will be towards the end of the presentation. Uh, Dr. Fowler, take it away. You know, I think one of the great important parts about medicine is that you're supposed to be working around people that you really enjoy. It was about uh, almost five years ago that Dr. Brandon Morchetti and I met up when he started his emergency medicine residency at Parkland Hospital in UT Southwestern. The day I met him after rounds, we went into a room at the moment that a man had stopped breathing. Brandon immediately jumped to the head of the patient and this was a man with emphysema. It was a very difficult intubation, which Brandon handled with great uh, success. And that was the way he and I met. He then went through the EM residency with us and then stayed on to join us as a fellow in emergency medical services um, uh, in the uh, Division of Emergency Medical Services at University of Texas Southwestern. He is now the Associate Chief of the Division of Emergency Medical Services and has multiple other jobs that he does, including as Associate Medical Director for the ninth largest urban EMS system in the United States, which is Dallas Fire Rescue. He has many more things that he does, but above all, he's one of the finest physicians I've ever known and one of the finest human beings. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to welcome my friend and my colleague and my associate division chief, 
for emergency medical services, Dr. Brandon Morchetti. Brandon, take it away. All right. And your grandson, don't forget. Oh, I meant to say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So um, thanks for that intro. And uh, I've been with you for the last few weeks. I'm excited to be able to do this talk for you. Um, the first point uh, that I'll teach you guys with uh, how to give a good talk is you got to come up with a cool title. And uh, hopefully this one suffices. So uh, with no further ado, um, oh, by the way, if you like QR codes, um, I put a lot through here. So have your phones ready, uh, links to different studies, articles, you know, profiles, whatever. Um, there'll be a lot of QR codes throughout here. All right. So first, a little bit of background about myself. I'll give you a timeline here. So graduated high school in 99, started my undergrad career. And for those of you who are trying to do math real fast, that makes me 39. I'll save you the trouble. Uh, and in September of 2001, around the time that many of you may have been born, uh, when I was in college, um, obviously was a significant turning point in our country. Um, I had my track set for me in undergrad, but this was uh, kind of a changing and life-defining moment for me uh, where I became very interested in public safety. I had been a lifeguard before. I had done CPR a couple times in my life up to that point, but at this uh, when this happened, I really got interested in public safety. And while I was undergrad, uh, I went to EMT school, became a firefighter, and in 2002, graduated EMT school. Started my career on an ambulance um, in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, the red line there is my EMS career um, in timeline format. And then uh, the next year I graduated with my bachelor's in health sciences. I started physical therapy school. And I kept working on the ambulance because that's how you pay bills. And it was a lot of fun. I would do a couple nights a week and I loved it so much. I wanted to do more, so I became a paramedic. Uh, I went to paramedic school doing night school while in physical therapy school and uh, graduated with my medic in 2005, kept working for the same company. It was a lot of fun. And uh, then the next year I finished physical therapy school and started my PT career, which is the green line here. And um, I had a clinic, it was Monday through Friday, did sports and orthopedics, um, it was a lot of fun. I uh, worked with a lot of uh, local high school athletes and it was um, a fairly rewarding career, but I really, really liked the ambulance. So I kept doing it uh, a couple times a month. I would keep working on the ambulance. And those were some uh, pretty unique uh, patient population. I love the cases that I did. Um, and while I had fun Monday through Friday being a physical therapist, I really loved working as a medic on the weekend. So much so that uh, with some help of you know, family and uh, friends, I decided I was going to try to go to medical school because I wanted to be an ER doc and an EMS physician. And um, I, I took the last couple of prereqs that I needed and I applied to the only school in Arkansas, uh, just one school, and I did not get in. Um, it was disappointing. Um, I did terrible on the MCAT. Um, if you're from the South, you know the difference between terrible and terrible. I did terrible uh, on the MCAT. And they would not let me in uh, due to that. I had a great GPA, obviously a clinical doctorate. I had my own clinic. I was a paramedic, but they weren't going to let me in with that MCAT. So because I really wanted to be a doc, I tried again the next year. I studied harder for the MCAT, did way better, and I accidentally got into med school then. They, uh, I, I still just applied to one school. I didn't want to move. Um, you know, I had kids and a wife already. And um, anyways, then I started med school in 2010. And at that point, you know, you ain't got time to do side jobs. Um, and I was going to just focus on studying. But then what happened was, Kids got to eat, and so I kept working part-time um, twice a week on the ambulance and two weekends a month doing acute care physical therapy while in med school. I don't recommend this. This will take years off of your lifespan. Um, and in 2014, after doing that, four years went by in a breeze, and um, I graduated med school, and I moved here to Dallas to do emergency medicine residency. I knew I wanted to do UT Southwestern uh, from the beginning. I came here because of EMS. Uh, Dr. Fowler and lots of other EMS faculty, usually, uh, they, they literally wrote the book on EMS physician medicine uh, many, many decades ago. 
and uh, I wanted to come here to learn from them. So at that point, I put my PT license and my uh, paramedic license in inactive status in Arkansas. I moved to Dallas and three years of blood, sweat, and tears, and then I graduated residency. And then to stay true to my path, I did uh, emergency medicine, or sorry, uh, EMS and tactical EMS fellowships, because um, what's more fun than doing one fellowship? Well, do both at the same time. And then I took my EMS boards, or sorry, my EM boards that year and um, uh, passed those two. And then uh, next summer graduated the fellowships and then last year passed my EMS boards. So uh, now doubly boarded. And it only took 20 years uh, to get to this uh, point. Kind of went roundabout uh, way of getting there, but I am living my dream job right now. So like Dr. Fowler said, here are my current roles. Um, obviously I work at UT Southwestern and I'm his protege uh, as associate division chief. Um, I have the honor and privilege of being the deputy medical director for Dallas Fire Rescue, which as he said, is the ninth largest city in the country, uh, over 200,000 EMS calls a year that they do. Um, also for the entire UT Southwestern and Parkland Biotel EMS system, which is around, um, it's about the fifth largest EMS system in the country with all run volume combined. I also get to be the assistant medical director for the Dallas Police Department and the SWAT team. I'm a reserve specialist and a tactical physician with that same SWAT team. Occasionally they call me up to do things with the Department of Public Safety. That's our state troopers, uh, Homeland Security, DEA, FBI, Secret Service. Um, and uh, I get to have fun with a lot of people in a lot of different places around North Texas. Um, also get to be one of the emergency medicine docs for our NHL team, Dallas Stars, uh, which I don't even like hockey or the cold, um, but I do get cool seats and good food when I work there. And so uh, I try to do at least a few games a year uh, ice side for them. Um, I get to help run our tactical EMS fellowship and then be core faculty for our EMS fellowship and for uh, running an EMT course for our medical students. Most importantly, my role, uh, as you see here, is that of a father and uh, a husband. So those are my four uh, beautiful kids. My son, he's 13. He's turning into a bit of a punk, but so was I when I was that age. All right, so why do we choose a career in healthcare? Um, you'll, you'll hear a lot of reasons, and a lot of them here are uh, kind of will be the same uh, for me as well as for you. You hear it's challenging. There's great job security. You'll make good money. Uh, it can be rewarding. Um, it can be defeating too, uh, just FYI, I don't want to spoil that one for you. Um, you'll meet lots of cool people, uh, but more commonly you hear, I want to help people. Um, and I'd encourage you to come up with something unique for your own personal statements, but really it gets down to, you want to help people. Me personally, I wanted to be an EMS doc. Uh, that's why I went to medical school. That's why I gave up the um, you know, career that I worked hard to achieve as a, a physical therapist and with two kids and went back to school and that sucked, uh, but that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to amplify what I could do. So as a paramedic, I go treat one patient and then at the end of that call, I treated one patient, but now I get to train 3,000 paramedics and those 3,000 paramedics go out and take care of hundreds of patients. And so um, for me, I get to sit back and say, you know, here in a county of 3 million people, um, how many of these people do I get to uh, touch? And that's public health, and I absolutely love public health. Um, so then why choose a subspecialty uh, after that? So you, you do your residency training, you get your specialty, then a subspecialty or a fellowship. Most people do it because they have clinical curiosity. Um, they they want to go learn more about that one thing. That's their niche. They, they want to uh, be really, really good at this one thing. Um, it comes down to uh, what's your passion. Um, ironically, most subspecialty uh, trainings that you do, um, you end up making less money. I can make more money just being an ER doc and just doing my shifts uh, than I could working as an EMS doc but I do it because I love it. Again, this is why I, I put in all the blood, sweat, and tears to get to this point uh, to do what I'm doing. These are a list of all the subspecialties that you can do after emergency medicine. This is from the Emergency Medicine Resident Association website. 
Um, you know, if you, you want to go be a NASA doctor, you want to do clinical forensics, you want to go do deep sea medicine, uh, you want to work on a cruise ship, um, you want to be a professional sports team doctor, you want to just do nothing but snake venom all the time, you want to go, you know, get paid to backpack, uh, or hike Everest or, you know, whatever as a wilderness medicine doc. There's so many things that you could do. And um, I'm, I'm going to be biased here. That's why people love ER docs, because we are pretty well rounded. We see anyone, anytime with any condition. And um, we see the most exciting first hour of every specialty. So um, that's why there's a lot of these subspecialties available to us because of how uh, unique our, our training and sub our specialty is. The red ones are ones you can get board certified in. And the ones that I highlighted here in boxes are the ones that we offer at UT Southwestern. Um, I did emergency medical services and tactical emergency medicine. So what is tactical medicine? Um, it's providing the medical services to law enforcement teams, SWAT teams, military personnel, dignitaries or VIP execs, things like that, or civilians in a high threat or austere environment. It does include extended duration ops, uh, mission driven law enforcement, enforcement special ops. There's a lot of preventive, urgent, and uh, less emergent medical care. Um, I spend a lot of time answering um, questions about, um, you know, hey doc, what's this rash? Or, hey doc, does CBD oil really help my ADHD? Um, or recently it's been a lot of, um, hey doc, uh, I got body aches and fever and cough. Do I got the COVID? And uh, I, I think I texted with one guy about five times a day about his negative COVID test um, being uh, likely that he doesn't have COVID. And then the sexy part of tactical medicine is the direct threat care or care under fire, which um, doesn't happen that often, thankfully, but obviously we have to learn about that. So who can do it? Um, you have to be licensed, a uh, medical provider, but not just any uh, provider, you have to be qualified and well-trained to do it. Um, not very often it's physicians that do it, but if a doc does it, they are usually emergency medicine or trauma surgeons most commonly. Um, there are a lot of PAs that I know that uh, get involved with tactical medicine, but uh, far in, in a way it is uh, paramedics and EMTs that embed themselves on a um, SWAT team from a local EMS jurisdiction. So uh, to go further into that question, can any licensed medical provider do this? Hail to the no. Uh, no, you don't want just anybody jumping in there and doing that. Um, you have to have advanced training and be proficient in all these things I list here. So rapid assessment and treatment, quick decision making ability, care under direct threats to your own life. You have to be okay with plugging someone else's bullet hole while you're getting shot at, while you're shooting back at other people. Uh, high risk procedures, evacuation procedures, and, and these are some big old boys that you got to carry out. Um, and I weigh about a buck fifty on a fat day, um, and carrying a lot of gear myself. Um, law enforcement operations, special weapons and tactics, which is what SWAT stands for. Canine medicine. Never thought I'd have to learn how to take care of a German Shepherd, but uh, it turns out that's a new skill set that I uh, took on. And then hazardous materials, explosives, all sorts of other things. We do nothing but go to class and do trainings and stuff all the time. So what are those special weapons? Um, we break them down into two categories. There's the lethal and the less lethal weapons. For lethal weapons, it, it's exactly as it sounds. It is designed to eliminate the threat to shoot to kill. Um, you think of pistols most of the time with patrol officers. Um, most of the SWAT trained officers also carry high powered rifles and pistols. Um, obviously different qualifications to carry a high powered rifle. The less lethal weapons, you have them in your escalation of force. Um, if there's not a direct threat to your life, but you need to incapacitate the subject and trying to minimize death or injury to them, that's when you have these other things listed here. The pictures are there too. So uh, tear gas, pepper spray, kinetic projectiles like rubber bullets or plastic uh, batons, bean bags, um, flashbangs, uh, tasers, things like that. 
Um, so what's the difference between being a SWAT team medical director and a SWAT team physician? Well, the SWAT team medical director, think of them like the primary care doc for the, the team. They keep the team healthy and ready to go fit for duty, but they rarely deploy with the team. Whereas a SWAT team physician deploys with the team and provides immediate tactical emergency casualty care and evacuation. So this, occasionally you get one doc that does both, and here in Dallas, that's us, we do both. So we are their primary care doctors and we tell them why CBD oil is probably not a good idea for their ADHD. And we also go out and do uh, tactical field care with them. Um, the difference between tactical medicine and military medicine. So tactical is civilian and domestic. We support local law enforcement jurisdictions. Sometimes it's local, sometimes it's state, regional, federal, things like that, but it's mostly medics or PAs, sometimes it's physicians. With military medicine, it's military appointment, you're usually overseas, usually on a battlefield, um, and you support military operations. They are mostly paramedics, rarely doctors. The military knows better than to take their most expensive asset and put them on the front line, so they usually put um, medics there, maybe calls them corpsmen. Um, they're some of the badass medics that you've ever met. And I love it when they come back to work for us because they have a, a pretty good skill set. Um, as far as the injuries that you see, military, think of a lot of more like roadside bombs, IEDs, amputations, um, concussive trauma and stuff like that, shrapnel injuries. Tactical medicine is more like, uh, you know, bullet wounds and uh, simpler things. Um, for Dallas Police Department, we are the Tactical Medical Support Team, TMST, and uh, there, are, there were five of us. We just added a sixth guy um, last week. So Dr. Alex Eastman, he is a trauma surgeon by training. He's been the, about the uh, 16 years he's been doing this. He is the chief medical officer for the entire uh, department. He is a sworn officer. He's a lieutenant, and he's a SWAT doc and one of my good friends. Uh, Dr. Jeff Metzger has been doing it just as long. They did, those two guys did fellowship together. Dr. Metzger is also one of my emergency medicine colleagues. He is also a sworn officer at the rank of senior corporal. He is uh, one of their medical directors and also a SWAT doc. Uh, Dr. Benitez um, has been doing it for, I don't know, 12, 14 years. Um, he's one of the assistant medical directors. He and I are both reserve specialists and assistant medical directors and the uh, SWAT physicians. Um, Dr. Antar is um, one of the newer members, been uh, on about two years, reserve specialist and SWAT doc. And then Dr. Mekri is also a sworn officer, um, just started his EMS fellowship with this July 1st, and we're excited to have him back home here in Texas. And I, uh, I want to get him uh, embedded with SWAT pretty soon because we're busy and we need help. And so it's always good to have an extra set of hands. Um, so protective and medical gear. Um, this is my personal stuff here. So the picture on the left there, my vest is level one gear. Uh, my black bag is level two and my blue bag is level three. And I'll explain what those levels mean here in a second. But as far as the vest goes, that is the heaviest rated vest that they make. It is made to stop high powered rifles, high velocity rounds, um, and there's a separate uh, bulletproof vest next to it that's more for like pistols. Um, it's, there's a helmet on the ground there. Um, and then I have those two bags with me. So what, um, oh, additional stuff. So that's me actually wearing the gear. Um, you got the helmet, the vest, the ballistic eye protection. You don't wanna get stuff in your eye while you're trying to take care of patients. I wear a gas mask. It's on my rear uh, right there. It's, it's hanging from my vest, you can't see it. Uh, weapons are optional. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, radio communications um, for medical gear. Um, everybody teaches you should have about three levels of medical gear. So level one is on my body. It is the things that I need while I'm getting shot at, laying on my back, trying to take care of somebody next to me. So it's, it's what you would think you would need. It's tourniquets and combat gauze um, you know, needle decompressions um, for the getting shot in the chest, um, chest seals, trauma shears, uh, things like that. Um, the things that you need on your body right then, right now, no time to open up a, a zipper or reach for stuff. 
Level two, I, I carry with it. Um, it's, it's like my man purse. It's my purse. It, it goes everywhere with me. Um, it's got my airway stuff. My well, I'll, I'll show you pictures here in a minute. Uh, level three is in the vehicle. That's more for like extended operation stuff. So the bag itself, um, the, the black bag, level two uh, is uh, my black bag. I've got an airway pouch and it opens up like, uh, like pages in a book. Um, so airway stuff uh, right there. The, the front of the bag has uh, extra um, uh, combat gauze, tourniquets and things like that that I can get to very, very quickly. Um, the first big pouch right there is all my airway stuff. And then the third pouch that opens up is all my IVs and my medications. My blue bag, the extended ops bag, is the things that, you know, it's more IV fluids. You, you know, your boy's got headaches, uh, ice packs, ACE wraps, um, suturing. I do a lot of wound care stuff that obviously I'm not going to, you know, pull out glass out of somebody's forearm and suture it while I'm getting shot at. So we're going to do that one a little bit later uh, when the bullets stop flying. Um, but that stays in the uh, armored vehicle. Um, speaking of armored vehicles, uh, here are ours. So um, they are bulletproof. The body, the glass, the tires, everything's bulletproof. Um, if you see that top picture that I'm standing in, right underneath the license plate, there's a plate there uh, that you hook up a big ram to that thing. Um, and that's how we uh, push down doors and gates and garage doors and things like that. Um, we have loudspeaker capabilities with them. We can fire weapons from within them. Um, up, up here, this is called a turret. Uh, you can poke your head out and um, shoot through that. Um, and then there's holes along the, the sides here. Uh, and you can see a little hole right here uh, where you can shoot through as well. Uh, we have lots of other undercover vehicles, but I'm not going to show them to you because this is going on YouTube and I don't want people to know what they look like, but just know we got a lot more. Uh, so what are our typical missions? Um, far and away, training ops are, it's almost a daily thing that we do is training. Um, the other eight things on here make up the rest of our time. We are a full-time SWAT team. Uh, some teams are not as busy and um, maybe the SWAT team is made up of some patrol officers, some narcotics officers, some um, you know crimes against persons detectives, and it's kind of piecemeal together. Dallas, we're very, very, very busy. Uh, you know, probably a couple hundred operations a year. We do a lot of high risk warrants, uh, both search warrants and arrest warrants. We do hostage rescues, barricaded subjects, uh, a lot of times with weapons, escaped fugitives riot control, active shooters, mass gatherings, and dignitary protection. So uh, speaking of dignitary protection, you're like, well, that sounds cool, but it's really not. Uh, it's a lot of waiting and sitting around and you don't get to go to the bathroom and there's no eating and it's, um, you drive really fast in the motorcade and it's actually kind of terrifying. And then you just stand around for a long time while the, the president uh, talks a lot and then you drive really fast back to the airport and then they fly away. And um, this is obviously the president, his plane, his cars. Uh, this is the governor here in Texas too. It's part of what we do. We provide security um, because of our skill set. Mass gatherings. Um, there are lots of times where you don't even know that SWAT is around some of these um, high profile events. Uh, one of the things that I um, like to do every year is the Texas OU game. Love me some college football. Uh, this is during the time of the state fair every year. It's at the Cotton Bowl Stadium. There's over 100,000 people there. Uh, game day was there a couple of years ago. Um, and you don't even know that SWAT is there. There's snipers on the roof. Uh, it's actually designated as a Homeland Security event uh, for high risk for terrorist activities. So um, we got plane clothes, plane clothes officers, we got um, SWAT embedded everywhere. And, and again, my role is just there for medical support. Although a couple years ago, I was standing in the tunnel, I did catch like three PATs uh, when Texas won. I'm a Razorback, by the way. I don't, I don't root for Texas or OU. Um, so for the um, notifications that we get, um, for the warrants, we usually get anywhere from like one to five days notice. They come by email. We don't get to pick the time. They pick it for us and we just have to make ourselves available. Um, everything else we get notified 
in real time as it's happening, which means we're on call 24 seven, which means I can't drink as much as I want to. Uh, how long do operations usually last? Uh, well, for high risk warrants, we pre-brief, sometimes we pre-pre-brief, then we pre-brief, then we brief, then we perform the operation. And it's usually about two to three hours long uh, if it's standard and nothing goes wrong. But for everything else, uh, like these barricaded subjects or these dignitary visits or the riot control stuff, um, you learn bladder control really well because uh, it's anywhere from like eight to 10 hours you're standing out there and um, you, um, you're wearing a lot of gear. I, I wear about 60 pounds worth of gear. I'm carrying a bunch of stuff with me um, and it's exhausting, especially in the Texas summers. All right, so last slide before we take a break here. Um, myth busting. Myth number one, a woman can't do this job. Um, if you have a death wish, I dare you to say that to some female uh, tactical SWAT docs that I know. Um, there are a couple that uh, are really, really good at this job. And really, all you have to know is uh, the medicine and then uh, be really good at some CrossFit, and you can do this job just fine. Um, there's rarely a time where I would have to drag out an officer by myself that I wouldn't have other people with me to help. Um, and it, it'd be the same for a female. Um, it's just, it's all about your mindset. Uh, myth number two, I have to become a sworn police officer to do this job. Uh, false, you do not have to be. In fact, most of the time, uh, tactical physicians are not sworn officers. We just happen to have uh, many on our own team, um, but that's by choice. Um, there are pros and cons to becoming a sworn officer. There's a lot of risk, there's a lot of liability, um, and especially in today's day and age, uh, you must consider that um, strongly before you, you make that commitment. Myth number three, I have to carry a gun to do this job. Uh, you don't have to. In fact, if you, are, well, if you're a sworn officer, you have to, um, you're required to. If you're not a sworn officer, you don't have to. Um, now you can have a, a, a license to carry and you can choose to carry even if you're not a sworn officer. Um, there are uh, pros and cons to carrying, and um, I encourage you to read this uh, short write-up that I did about those pros and cons for the American College of Emergency Physicians tactical EMS newsletter um, about those pros and cons for further information on that. Uh, myth number four, I can't do this job without a military or law enforcement background. Um, I think I'm proof that that is false. Um, I did not have a military background. I don't have a law enforcement background before I started doing this. And um, I, when I worked as a medic, I did do some tactical medic stuff um, back in Arkansas, but I, not near to the degree that I do it now as a doc. Number five, any medical specialty prepares you for this job. Um, I'm pretty sure you don't want a, a kidney specialist or maybe a cardiologist doing this job um, unless they just happen to have a pretty unique background. Um, I, think that if they are trained, they certainly can, but in general, this job requires a procedural competency that you should um, get in your residency training. I would not trust myself to be a good tactical medicine doctor if I wasn't already a decent ER doc uh, before I took on this training in this fellowship. Okay, time for some questions. Okay. Uh, so one question somebody asked was, being non-traditional, did you find it difficult to demonstrate your passion for medical school or being a doctor specifically, considering your EMT experience? Yeah, you know, when I decided to go back to med school, I went to the one school in Arkansas and I uh, talked to the, um, the admissions office and they told me that the biggest challenge I was going to have, I had to answer two questions, uh, why medicine? And why now? Uh, almost as if it was an afterthought. And so um, I thought about that long and hard um, and came up with uh, an answer that didn't fly the first time, apparently. Um, and then so I, I worked on it for the second time. So I didn't want them to think that, um, that I was just like, oh, this is something else to check off my list. Um, so yeah, being a, a non-traditional uh, student coming in, with a career already, um, I had to convince them that I was a good choice for their um, uh, matriculation class. How was it juggling family life and schoolwork? 
What's your advice on parenting through pre-med and med school? Uh, you know, actually, I think it probably helped, to be honest with you. Not that you should go have kids before you start med school just to do it, but um, I think for me, I didn't have much time to uh, mess around, go play, go party. Uh, my time was uh, very, very limited. I was either in class or, you know, feeding kids, working on homework, um, you know, getting them ready for bed, or I was working uh, since I had two jobs. And so when I only had two hours to study, it was a very, very productive and efficient two hours. But whereas if I start the morning and I have all day just to do whatever, I'm probably not going to be as efficient uh, with my studying or as diligent with my time management. Uh, so for me, I was I had a very structured, disciplined routine uh, throughout med school, and and I went into it knowing that that's what I had to do. So it, I thought it was actually an advantage. Uh, what's your favorite part about what you do, and what has been the most challenging part of your journey in medicine? Uh, the favorite part about what I do, I think, is what I mentioned about amplifying uh, my effect for medicine. So. Uh, even as an ER doc, I, I see one patient in the ER, I treat one patient, and in the end, I helped one patient. Um, with what I do as an EMS doc and a, um, you know, having 3,000 paramedics, I feel like I make a bigger difference in my community by improving the standard of care and the pre-hospital system. And uh, what was the other question, the biggest challenge? Uh, sure, yeah, what's the biggest challenge you faced while um, mm -hmm. doing medicine? Uh... Uh, I guess for me, it would uh, probably be trying to maintain adequate roles as a husband and father uh, during all this. Um, obviously, this job can take a lot out of you, take a lot of time, and uh, I had to learn to schedule time with the family, or uh, you'll blink a couple weeks will go by and you hadn't spent 30 minutes with them. So um, just being diligent about uh, learning how to say no. Um, Dr. Fowler has helped me with that. Awesome. Um, another a lot of practice to say no. <laughs> um, another question that was asked was, uh, what are the main differences between ER and EMS? Um, I think the care of the patient is, is pretty similar. So, um, you know, the, the care that I provide in the ER, a lot of paramedics can provide that same level of care outside the ER before the patient shows up. And so, I write protocols and the, the paramedics implement those protocols. Um, but I think the, probably the biggest difference is the resources. So, um, you know, and you, you bring a trauma patient to me in the ER and it's me, I've got residents, respiratory therapists, multiple nurses and techs and pharmacists and all kinds of people around to help. Um, some people I don't want in there, but they're there. With paramedics, you got that same trauma, it's you and your partner. If you're lucky, you got some firemen with you uh, to help. But, um, you know, when I was a medic, I, I learned how to be quite resourceful to be all of those roles in one person. Um, so I think resources is probably the biggest difference. I would also add to that, uh, Brandon, that, and I think you would agree that in the field, in EMS, we have non-physician delegated practice, uh, dependently licensed individuals trying to identify if a situation may be present that falls into a certain category, such as chest pain, uh, abdominal pain, trauma, and so forth, uh, to determine if the patient should go to the hospital for further evaluation and management. In the hospital, we are independently licensed practitioners, and our job is to make a diagnosis by way of doing a differential uh, diagnostic method and to try to determine what needs to be done and, uh, and to determine what is the most final treatment that the patient needs, Mary. Um, another question somebody was asking was, are you able to shadow a SWAT doctor or is that um, not possible um, just because of the situations that you guys are in? Um, it is possible. We have uh, residents that we take out with us a lot of times. Um, only for the warrants. The warrants are planned. Uh, they're, they're more controlled. Um, I have, uh, I, I can main, I, I can, I don't want to say promise. I never want to promise anything, but um, it's much more likely that the shadower will be safe on a warrant. 
uh, no way in hell I'd take y'all out on a call out or, you know, barricaded subject, hostage situation, active shooter, anything like that. Um, and right now in the era of COVID, obviously, we're not taking um, people out. We, uh, we're a, a large team. Uh, there's no physical distancing. We don't have that option. Um, so it, it's too much risk right now. But yeah, as far as um, shadowing goes, I take residents out all the time as part of their EMS education uh, at Parkland. Awesome. Um, and then another question, uh, what type of physical training or fitness does it, um, do you need to maintain for this sort of position? Um, so to get on the team, um, I had to pass uh, a Cooper fit test. It's just a standardized physical fitness test. Uh, not terrible. Um, then I had to do a week of uh, SWAT school. So that sucked. Uh, by day three, I'm pretty sure I was in rhabdo. Um, I didn't pee all day. I uh, thought my kidneys were shutting down. Um, and I was carrying people three times my size, wearing a bunch of gear. And um, it was uh, it was humbling. It was fun, um, but I, I challenged myself and, and was able to do it. Uh, we have to pass physical fitness tests quarterly, so um, whatever it, it takes for you to stay in shape to pass the tests every three months. Um, you know, running a few miles and that's time doing a certain number of push-ups, sit-ups, uh, things like that. But and you, you hardly get through one operation, uh, one mission uh, with being out of shape, especially, you know, you're wearing all that gear, it's hot outside and you're, uh, you know, carrying a bunch of stuff. So people know if you're huffing and puffing. Uh, let me know when you want to move on. There's quite a few more questions. Um, another question that somebody asked was, uh, what would you say to students who are interested in both PT and medical school? How do I know which one's right for me? Oh, you got to get out in the shadow. Um, I made the mistake of not shadowing any PTs before I went to PT school. And I, I thought I knew what they did. Um, I played uh, baseball in college and uh, I knew what athletic trainers did. I knew how they rehabbed injuries. And I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. I can be a PT. They kind of do the same thing. And uh, I went into it a little bit naive. Um, not that I didn't enjoy being a PT. I just like, doing emergent patient care a lot more uh, but for you to figure that out you just got to get out there into the pt clinics uh, and, and do a lot of do acute care pt inpatient rehab um, outpatient pt go on some sidelines with some sports teams work with some uh, different specialists of physical therapy kind of see all of it um, versus medical school obviously there's you know 50 plus different medical specialties you can do uh, one more question awesome. Uh, last question, what is the most critical skill you think is necessary to go into tactical medicine? Um, quick thinking, uh, probably. Uh, you, you have to be pretty quick on your feet with decision making. Um, that's, that's probably it. Uh, obviously flexible, and I don't mean like you can stretch good. I mean like you can adapt um, on the fly with situations. So. All right, case time, uh, and then we'll do more questions at the end. So we're going to go through three cases. Uh, case number one, it's a standard narcotics warrant. Uh, we get emailed that we uh, have a narcotics warrant in 48 hours. It's scheduled, and we know where to show up for our, our briefing. Um, and I don't get to pick the time. Just somebody on our team has to make ourselves available to go cover that. It doesn't matter if I'm between night shifts or you know, whatever, it's just a sacrifice we make. Um, between that moment and about two hours before the briefing starts, uh, the team will prepare by uh, doing drive-bys on the uh, target address, uh, getting video, uh, kind of staking out the structure, seeing who's coming and going, studying the past rap sheet on the address or the suspects. Sometimes we hit the same place, uh, you know, we hit it a few months ago or a year ago. It's like a game of whack-a-mole around here with uh, uh, trap houses and, and drug houses. So um, you determine how many uh, SWAT members you're going to need. And then two hours before the warrant is executed, you meet for a pre-brief with just the SWAT team and, and ourselves, and we discuss everyone's roles and responsibilities. And um, 
Now, I want you all to use the chat feature here. This is the interactive portion of the lecture. What type of things as a tactical medical provider would you think you'd want to know during that pre-brief? And I'll give you a hint. It's about threat assessment and mitigation. So yeah, how the, how the person looks, a description is good. Uh, so level of risk, are they armed? Yeah, I wanna know what kind of weapons and how many, how dangerous are they? If they have a history of violence, medical history is good. I'm probably not going to know their blood type. Um, narcotics, damn, I'm going fast. Uh, how many suspects, uh, if they're intoxicated? Um, I'm going to go with they're probably intoxicated. It's a crack house. Um, children, yes, absolutely. Whoever said that. Escape routes, uh, how many SWAT members, what weapons, hostages, criminal record. Cool. Yeah, I think y'all done this a time or two. All right, let's go through. So yeah, somebody said, how many and what type of weapons are involved? How many suspects? How old are they? Uh, do they have a history of violent behavior or have they threatened law enforcement in the past? Do they have a psychiatric history? Um, are we going to use distraction devices, flashbangs? How many? Where are they going to be? Obviously, we, we need to know where the blasts are going off uh, when we bust up on their scene. Are we going to use shotgun breaches, like a shotgun to you know, blow a lock off of a gate or something? How many of those and where? Who's doing it? Chainsaw breaches, same thing. We you know, bust through gates and fences with chainsaws. I want to know where those are going to be. Energetic breaches, those are explosives to blow open uh, doors and whatnot. Are there elderly kids? Uh, good eyes, those are our lookouts. Um, so, uh, and dogs, yeah, I, I actually forgot to put dogs in there. I, I ask about dogs all the time too. I saw somebody put that in the chat. Um, and then is it an action on arrival or a surrounding call out? So basically, do we turn the corner and tear your house up uh, within 30 seconds or do we surround it and call you out? Uh, yeah, language barriers are good, although we do have a, a lot of uh, multilingual uh, people on our, our SWAT team. Um, ethnicity, we don't care. Um, handicaps, we do care. So. All right, other things. I want to know how my team is feeling today. Um, you know, did COVID just sweep through our team and everybody is uh, short of breath with diarrhea and can't smell? Um, or is everybody feeling good and healthy? Um, what are the weather conditions? Um, you know, if it's 98 degrees with heat index of 108, it's going to suck. Um, if it is in the 70s, it's much better. I want to know the layout of the structure. A lot of times uh, we do get a pretty good floor plan. Um, and, you know, we have landlords that can help. Sometimes we hit the structure before, so we got really detailed floor plans. Um, I want to know how do I access all the parts of the structure if there was a medical emergency? How do I get around to the backside? Where are the fences? Where are the gates? Where are the obstacles? Because um, I, I need to get to everyone everywhere at any time uh, during this mission. Are there nearby schools, daycares, other public places that I need to worry about? Um, where's my nearest trauma center and what would be my evacuation route to that trauma center? Um, I memorize that route before we go out. Um, if it's more than uh, 10 miles, I'll get an ambulance on standby. Um, if it's under 10 miles, we are just going to take one of our squad cars um, or vans or Tahoes um, and uh, go by a police vehicle. But I memorize that route so that if I am uh, in the back taking care of uh, an officer, then I can just uh, tell them, turn here, turn there, north on this street, you know, however many blocks and, and all that. Um, how do I give pre-notification of my arrival to the trauma center? Um, so I pull up the phone number to uh, part of the, the good thing about being the medical director for the entire EMS system is I got some safe phone numbers and I just, uh, I'll ask Siri uh, to call those numbers for me. And then my best mode of transport. So do I go uh, by um, squad car or police Tahoe or van or armored vehicle, or do I have an ambulance on standby? If it's not life-threatening, I need to go right now, I can call an ambulance in and they'll be there uh, within about three or four minutes in most of our cases. So that's, that's the pre-brief. Um, it's a busy hour uh, for me, getting a lot of information. And then one hour before the warrant is executed, we have the whole SWAT team and our narcotics unit, this is a narcotics warrant, come in and we brief the entire operation 
We discuss everyone's roles and responsibilities, answer any final questions. Everyone knows what everyone else is going to do. And I have to know everybody's role and where the threats are with their roles um, in case I need to uh, jump in and help. I'll call and make any necessary arrangements with the nearest fire station to have an ambulance on standby in case I need them for a ride. Again, the closer I am to a trauma center, the less likely I am to do that. The further away, I, I don't like being far away from a trauma center without a ride. Now it's time to load up and get to work. So we're going to the target location. Uh, this is called riding the rails. Uh, people, um, you know, dressed up full kit and tactical medical gear, and they are uh, standing on the perimeter of the armored unit so that as soon as we pull up to the structure, there's no time. You don't want to open the door and people, you know, climb out. No, you just, you show up and you get to work. Um, it's very, very quick. Um, here is video. <laughs> Pay attention to how quick the team is with getting into the house. All right, so uh, no, those were not gunshots. That was a nine banger, we call that. That is a diversionary or distractionary device. That's a flashbang. It is made to disorient um, the suspect. So you notice we had to crash a gate. We had to get everybody off, get them through the gate. Anytime there's gonna be any delay, we try to create confusion and chaos for the people inside the house. So that was a flashbang going off, a nine banger to be specific. Um, that was not somebody firing at us. So in 30 seconds from turning on, right, in 30 seconds from turning onto their street, we uh, were in their house uh, putting uh, plastic zip tie handcuffs on people. So here's another um, example. They have a little bit more trouble getting into the front door on this one. So you notice on that one, they could not get in the front door. That was our plan A. That was uh, an um, alpha side or front side entry. Uh, turns out that door had a barricade behind it. That's why that big strong man couldn't knock the door down. So they actually got in on the other side. We always have multiple points of entry. We're trying to get into your house on every side at the same time. Um, so that's why you have to be flexible and have a plan A, B, C, D, E, et cetera. Um, this is an example of an energetic breach. Uh, this is going to go in slow-mo. Uh, we, we put a strip of um, explosive device on the front door uh, to blow off um, hinges or a handle and uh, play this one in slow-mo for you here. <laughs> All right, so that's an energetic breach. This is another example of an energetic breach on a motel room. 
Um, the suspect we knew was sleeping at this point. So they have to go up quietly, stealth, place the explosive on the door without being noticed. And then they go around the corner. Uh, another explosive breach there. On narcotics warrants, we do a lot of damage. Um, obviously, we have to make entry. It's all about the element of surprise. Um, we don't have time to let them know that we're out there. It could be very dangerous. They could fire upon us. They could breach uh, or barricade themselves inside. It's all about the element of surprise here. So. Um, we, we do a lot of damage, we document all the damage we do, and um, we do actually pay for it and repair all the damage that's done. So we try to minimize it, but not at the expense of the safety of the team. Um, so in summary, the, uh, for this first case, the tactical medicine provider must know every team member's personal health history, current state of health, how to practice medicine in an austere environment, how to make split second decisions, situational awareness and safety, every team member's role and uh, location, um, all medical threats that exist on every operations, ways to get to all points of your target location, egress route for any casualties, all while trying not to get shot or blown up. So yeah, it's a pretty easy job. Um, I encourage y'all to uh, definitely, definitely go hang out with a uh, SWAT doc if you want to see um, multitasking at its best. All right, case number two. This is a hostage situation. Um, this is modified from a real case that we had recently. Um, so shortly after midnight, 12.38 um, a.m., got a call out notification for a barricaded female subject who was holding her two children hostage within about four minutes. We're dressed, we're, uh, you know, most of us are probably in bed asleep at this point. So we're up, we're dressed, we're en route to the address, provided the, uh, the safe route. To get there, you obviously don't want to pull up in front of the, the house um, when someone has a weapon and is barricaded. Uh, within a few minutes, um, 17 minutes, you get to the scene, you immediately put on all of your bulletproof protective gear, you check your communications, radio, you gear up, you make contact with the command post and the SWAT commander, and he gives you the assignment of where to go. Um, over the next 20-ish minutes, uh, other SWAT elements or SWAT officers arrive and they are deployed with uh, their respective positions to set up a perimeter around and that's, that's what the SWAT commander does. Um, he kind of uh, delegates people to different roles and positions around the team. So uh, this is not the actual Google Maps address because that would not be appropriate to show but um, we have the, uh, an example here. So you're putting the armored personnel carrier that's on the alpha side, on the front of the house, that's what alpha is. It's alpha, bravo, charlie, and delta, and uh, uh, clockwise. So you have your three levels of medical gear with you. You're in the armored vehicle in the front of the house. So you, uh, you look up Google Maps. I use Google Maps and Google Earth a lot on these calls. Um, some, you'll put in the chat, what are some things you notice about this particular structure? Yep, gates, there's a um, big shed in the back, multiple structures, closed buildings in the back, lots of room for people to hide, um, close to neighbors. I don't know what those neighbors are up to. Um, yeah, you'll see the big gate, you see the abandoned vehicle. Um, you see the uh, toys in the back too. Um, so yeah, uh, Google Earth and um, uh, Google Maps satellite view is actually where we get a, a lot of intel in real time like this where we don't otherwise have it. Um, you get an email about the suspect's information. So um, like we talked to, or like we talked about with the first case, what are some things you want to look for? So 
I, I want to know their history. Um, I want to know their history of violence. Um, do they do they have a weapon registered to them? Um, do they, uh, you know, how many times have they been arrested and what for? Um, any type of domestic disturbances, uh, things like that. I probably won't get a lot about mental illness from their um, uh, law enforcement rap sheet, um, but given that um, that I work at Parkland, where we see a lot of our um, uh, county population and uninsured care, um, I do have access to easily look up by name and birth date um, for any type of medical or psychiatric history. Um, while I'm sitting in that armored vehicle, I'm looking for the nearest trauma center um, and uh, I study and memorize the egress route like before. And I'm listening on the radio while I'm doing all that uh, so that other team members as they arrive, I know who's here and where they're going. So during all that, you find out, um, you, look, you see the number of structures on the property, you see where the fences and the gates are, you see, oh, I forgot to call in at the doghouse. Um, you see the doghouse, multiple obstacles in the backyard. Um, you find out that the children are an 11-year-old male and an 8-year-old female. And you learn that the mother was recently separated from the father, and the father was awarded custody. There were some CPS claims regarding the mother's ability to care for the children due to mental illness. So you kind of get all of your um, information there uh, pretty handedly. Um, and uh, you learn that the father has a handgun registered to him, but it's unaccounted for currently. But you already know from patrol that the um, barricaded subject has a weapon. So, and patrol was surrounding the house when we showed up. Um, and of course, uh, my nearest trauma center now I know is six miles away or about 10 minutes. So about 2 a.m., we begin the typical escalation for these surrounding call-outs for a barricaded subject. Um, within five minutes, uh, at the command post, our negotiators are trying to reach the subject by telephone. We usually have access to um, cell phone numbers, home numbers, and things like that. By this point, we have collateral history from family members that are involved, obviously concerned family members that are giving us information to try to help. Uh, about 20 minutes goes by, we're not successful, so now we're trying to reach her by the loudspeaker on our armored vehicle outside. After that, um, you have escalating threats that you can use if you need to. Um, so within a, about 25 minutes, uh, almost an hour total of trying to reach her without success, now we're dropping a, a few flashbangs out the, the front door and the back door to try to get their attention, like, hey, we're still here, um, you know, we, we've announced ourselves, we're not going away, we mean business, you need to pick up the phone and, and talk to us uh, so we can help you out with whatever you need right now. Um, after about 25 minutes, um, there's no response from that, so uh, you, can, you can fire different things into the house, uh, you can use gas rounds, uh, we choose to use uh, some paint-filled shells. Think of them like big angry paintball uh, bullets. Um, you fire them uh, so that it, it makes a loud noise, a pop, and then sprays a, a paint so that they know like, oh man, they mean business, I better, I better end this now and end it peacefully. Um, and if uh, that doesn't work, then we can use the boom uh, on the front of the armored vehicle uh, the, the big long metal arm to push in a door or break out a window uh, to gain visual access or to throw a robot in or something like that. Um, other things we could use, you got the gas rounds, like I mentioned, you got the robot. Some departments use a drone. We, we don't have a drone. We just use a, uh, a robot. Um, and then the use of uh, your team to actually breach with weapons armed and ready. In our case, we didn't get to use any of those last three there because as soon as we breached the door, we were met by a barrage of gunfire from within the house towards the team. There was a few ricochet wounds for some of the guys, no one seriously injured, but it, it certainly got our attention and we retreated back quickly to safe position for cover and we knew that um, she meant business, um, that this was not your typical hostage situation. Obviously, uh, it's not typical that they're female. It's not typical that they're holding their own children hostage. It's not typical that the female has a violent history. It's not typical that they fire on officers. So uh, we know right away that this one is yeah. Yeah. 
I think somebody needs to mute. Uh, we knew this one was going to be different. Um, over the next 30 minutes, we continue to try to reach the subject by telephone, no success. Um, about that point, the 11 year old boy comes running out of the house uh, to safety with us. Um, we uh, continue using our escalated threats. Um, within about five minutes, uh, we had learned that the, the barricaded subject, who's the mother and the daughter, they're still in the house in the back room. Um, we continue for an additional 25 minutes. We hear nothing, see nothing, no signs of anything uh, from within the house. And then suddenly there's two gunshots from within the home, uh, at which point we get ready uh, immediately, um, you know, full kit, we run in and rapid clearance of the home. We find two subjects in the back room uh, deceased from a gunshot wound. It's a presumed um, murder suicide of the uh, eight year old girl and the mother. This one sucked. Um, this is not your typical case. Um, what we learned from this, it's, I mean, it's something that we, we knew could happen. It's certainly not the first time. It won't be the last time, but it doesn't happen a lot, thankfully. Um, the person who most impacts the outcome of a mission is usually the targeted subject. No matter how much we prepare, um, they dictate the pace of the operation. We try to influence that, but we are not always are successful. Um, also, um, many of us could have been injured that night, uh, some were. Um, sometimes the wounds are emotional rather than physical. Debrief is a very, very important part of our operation as a team. Mental health is something that I'm always having to check up on with the guys. Um, we, we very much are a family. We look out for each other. We don't let anyone internalize or compartmentalize uh, their feelings, we, we encourage them to uh, talk about it. And, and part of the trick of this job is knowing how each of them react to this and um, being able to work with them on that. Um, all right, third and final case. Today is July 7th. Um, this was a very, very meaningful day four years ago tonight, um, actually about um, 45 or 30 minutes from now as a matter of fact 45 minutes from now um, where we had a uh, ambush of Dallas police officers where multiple officers were shot and killed tonight is the four-year anniversary of this and I thought it would be timely and appropriate to do a, a case study on this one here so July 7th 2016 uh, there were planned protests that evening all across the country in response to some recent high-profile police shootings. Around 7 p.m., there were 800 protesters at a park in downtown Dallas and about 100 officers who were uh, providing security for the event. It was supposed to be peaceful. There were no threats mentioned um, anywhere, and they were there to uh, protect their uh, rights to freedom of speech. Um, around 8.15, they were marching through downtown, and at um, 8.57 p.m., Micah Johnson arrived. Um, this is a map of downtown Dallas here. Um, this square is around El Centro College. Um, if you look immediately to the, well, actually the, um, the square is covering it. This is the large Bank of America building, the tallest building in downtown Dallas. If you've seen the skyline, this is literally right next to that in, in the shadow of the Bank of America building. Uh, zooming in on that right there, um, El Central College is a community college in downtown Dallas. It was the epicenter for this night. Uh, Micah Johnson parked his Tahoe right there on that yellow X. And at this point, I'm going to play this uh, approximately six minute video that it was a news piece from one year after the shooting that does a good job of kind of recreating the sequence of events for that night. Here we are, one year later now, and the ambush is still technically considered an open investigation. And because of this, an official account of the events has not yet been released, and we wouldn't expect that. Investigative reporter Brian New here tonight to update us on one year later where we exactly stand with the investigation. Brian? 
Doug, we know 11 officers along with the gunman fired a weapon that night. And as with any officer involved shooting, the case must be reviewed by a grand jury. Today, we learned that that will happen next week. Until then, we've had to rely on law enforcement sources as well as eyewitnesses to create a timeline of what took place right out here one year ago. The night started with a protest. Internet is not happy. Let's try that one more time. Here we are, one year later. Fast forward it a bit. And Doug, we know 11 officers along with the... Oh, come on. I think uh, 900 plus people on a Zoom right now. <laughs> Maybe my uh, men fired a weapon that night, and as with any officer involved shooting, the case must be reviewed by a grand jury. Today, we learned that that will happen next week. Until then, we've had to rely on law enforcement sources as well as eyewitnesses to create a timeline of what took place right out here one year ago. Oh man! All right. Well, I'm not gonna. We labor this right now. Um, so, uh, if y'all can mute, please. So, um, I'll give you a um, breakdown using this map right here. So, um, Micah Johnson parked his car right here on this yellow X. He proceeded south on Lamar to uh, this corner right here where he first made conversation with a few um, officers before he just randomly opened fire. This was uh, open carry. There were lots of people with armed, um, with long rifles and uh, ballistic gear, and he was no exception. Um, and so there was no reason to think that he was a threat. He was making casual conversation. And then he suddenly opened fire. He shot and killed three officers at that corner injured three others, uh, shot and injured two civilians. Then he takes off north on Lamar Street uh, where he engages with and shoots a couple more uh, officers and um, injures them, doesn't kill them. And then uh, turns and tries to enter into uh, El Centro uh, Building A right here and uh, shoots two officers that are inside um, but uh, doesn't kill them, just injures them. He can't get in because those officers uh, kind of stood their ground right there. So he's making his way north again. He ends up shooting and killing another police officer here. Then he goes around on the north side of the building and gains entry uh, to the building through a door here. He makes his way up through the stairwell to the second floor. At this point, he's injured because a lot of officers have returned fire and he's leaving a blood trail, which is how officers knew how to track him inside. He comes up here to a hallway where he's at a dead end, but there's a window right here. So he shoots out the window at this 7-Eleven over here, shoots and injures one officer, shoots and kills another officer. And at that point, he's run out of people to shoot. So he makes his way down a long hallway where he is uh, trapped. At this point, he's cornered. He's about 30 feet away from officers. And at this point, SWAT had arrived and uh, had cornered him. And let me skip ahead to... All right, so um, the first shots rang out at 2058. And then within five minutes, the SWAT call out went out for us that there was an active shooter in downtown Dallas. Within six minutes, the first elements were on scene. And the scary part about this is you can hear the shots ringing out. You, you don't know how many shooters, you don't know how many were injured, how many were dead. We didn't know where he was located or if, even if it was a he. I uh, didn't know if there were any secondary explosive devices uh, hanging around. There were so many unknowns. All we knew is that um, he was in that building, at least one shooter, and that patrol had him um, 
blocks down a long hallway. So um, within about six minutes later, uh, lots of other SWAT officers arrived and tore into El Centro to create a uh, perimeter. Over the next roughly four hours, there were multiple attempts at negotiations that failed. Um, we could communicate with him, but they were not going well. Um, he was uh, antagonistic and, and talking about how um, he wanted to know how many did he kill and, and were there more that he could kill. Um, and you know, singing songs and, and very inappropriate, not engaging with our uh, expert negotiators at all. Meanwhile, um, exchanging gunfire, um, over 200 gunshots between SWAT and the suspect, um, where uh, no one was shot, of course, during that time. Um, around 11.35, uh, they were started to have multiple reports of suspicious packages nearby, so the bomb squad gets involved. Around 12.30, he tells us that he placed a lot of bombs throughout downtown and in the college as well. Um, also around that same time, our police chief had devised a, a plan uh, because we were getting nowhere and it was highly dangerous with, you know, obviously he's a skilled military trained um, marksman and he knows what he's doing. Um, so they devised a plan to strap one pound of C4 to our tactical robot and drive it down the hallway and detonate it. Um, at 1.21 a.m. is when that happened and killed the suspect and um, um, Dr. Eastman was actually the one that uh, pronounced him deceased that night. Uh, the aftermath of that, there were 16 people that were shot in total. Uh, 14 of them were officers, two were civilians. Five of those officers died um, and the suspect died as well. Um, I was in the ER that night at Parkland, um, and that top right picture is Parkland. We got four of the officers um, of the five that had died. Um, the other, the fifth one that had died uh, went to Baylor in downtown Dallas. Um, that, that was uh, a night that rocked the city, it rocked law enforcement uh, all over the country. It was the deadliest night for law enforcement since September 11th. Um, which I thought was kind of ironic at that point in my career since September 11th was the reason I got into uh, this job in the first place. The, uh, the link that's right there, uh, the QR code, is to one of the best articles that I've read about this. It is a Dallas Morning News article, which is actually, it's a paid subscription. I don't know if you want to pay one month subscription just to read the article. It won all kinds of awards. Um, it's an interactive uh, article and um, it has way more detail with it uh, like down to uh, getting into the mind of the negotiators uh, some of my colleagues on the SWAT team and a, a lot more detail about that night in the interest of time and uh, though um, that's the end for um, uh, this third case though uh, and which I want to spend the last couple minutes here just transitioning into I know this is a challenging time for our country. Uh, this is a time where as a country we are at crossroads with law enforcement and uh, civilians where we are looking uh, very, very honestly deep down at how we're trained and why we're trained the way that we are and uh, what that means and what are our internal biases and how can we um, beat these things that have been just kind of status quo or um, uh, just, you know, quote unquote, the norm uh, recently. And these are pictures from just a couple weeks ago uh, with the protest here in downtown Dallas. And um, it was a, a very challenging few days with the, uh, the riots and uh, there were people that were uh, really had no part of the, the protests at all. They were just there to hurt and cause harm and damage and destruction uh, to, to further their own interests uh, and actually destroyed what the protesters were trying to do to, to make change happen. Uh, luckily, the riots only lasted a few days and then it was peaceful protesting after that. But these were some of the photos from um, those few days. This was one of the more powerful um, sequence of images here. Um, and I, I just wanted to uh, kind of end with this. So um, there was a photographer, a news reporter that was there and uh, caught this where 
there are some Dallas police officers there who are there to provide security for this particular street and barricade that street to allow the protesters to do what they want to do and need to do and have the right to do. And it, it got a little bit heated. The photographer was capturing these moments here where there was some, they were engaging the officers. Uh, they were trying to get the officers to kneel. They were getting closer and closer and closer to the officers. And everybody was wondering what's going to happen next. And um, I think it was, it was fitting of who we are as a department that um, we are the type of officers where uh, we, are, we are for the people, um, without a doubt. Uh, we live in this community. We, uh, we go to stores with these people. Our kids go to schools together. And uh, our officers got out of their vehicles and kneeled with them. And now, just that moment with that officer doing that, defused an entire crowd of hundreds of people. And it could have got, uh, could have got way out of control. Um, but, you know, in law enforcement across the country, 99.9% .9 of officers got into this because they truly care about people. They want to help people. They want to help people that can't help themselves. Um, I got into this job because, uh, you know, these, these officers keep me and my family safe. I'd like to make sure they go home safe to their family at, at night, as well as being there for civilians and suspects and, you know, EMS and paramedics can't get in quick enough. I need to be there to provide them the care uh, immediately so there's no delays in care uh, for everybody. So we got into this because we truly care about uh, civilians. So um, I think that the, the few officers that are out there that got into this for the wrong reasons give us all a bad rap. And, and their judgment day is coming. And, and just know that there's a lot of talk in this profession of uh, we are changing. We're changing the way we do our training. We're changing the way we de-escalate. We're changing the way that we do uh, crisis intervention training. Um, so know that all these voices over the last uh, few weeks, um, they're, they're being heard loud and clear uh, with open ears. Okay. Um, this is my family. Uh, these are these are our guys. This is our um, our SWAT team. Um, they would do anything for me. I'd do anything for them. Uh, they all have families. They all love taking care of uh, their community. Um, so, in summary, tactical medicine is a very unique subspecialty. Obviously, as I've uh, hopefully shown you here. Uh, it combines emergent care, resuscitation, and life-saving procedures with occupational health and primary care, and special knowledge of uh, special weapons, tactics, and law enforcement operations. Um, most commonly through emergency medicine, EMS, and trauma uh, critical care surgery, but also, like I said, there's a lot of PAs and medics that uh, do this too. But if doctors are going to do this, uh, make sure you pick a specialty that gives you the procedural competency to do it. And then uh, finally, uh, just remember that subspecialty training should be a way to get paid for your passion. So find out what it is that gets you out of bed in the morning that you just you love going to do. Uh, because I promise there's going to be days that this job is a beat down for you. And uh, you're going to want to make sure that you, you love what you do. Um, because you're going to question it uh, several times. So uh, that's all I had. This is the um, assessment information there, uh, which I, I saw the pin uh, had been put in. The password is my last name, all lowercase. It's open till Friday nights. There's 10 questions. I gave you all the answers in this talk. And I appreciate you all listening. Brandon, Dr. Morchetti, uh, on behalf of the whole team, we just, uh, I think we're speechless about what we've heard tonight. Uh, it was an astonishing presentation, especially given your up close, personal, eyes on connection. I know from some of the after action report, reporting that went on after the incident four years ago, how deeply moved the surgeons and you and all the rest of the team who were at Parkland alone, who, uh, trying to resuscitate the police officers that were shot. And uh, we very much deeply appreciate the service that all of you have done. Thank you. Ma'am, I think we may have some questions from the group. What do you think? Awesome.
Um, okay, so first one, how do you keep your emotions under control when going into hostile situations as these? Uh, I think raising a teenager has helped. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I, um, I, I think I've always considered myself to be kind of an even-keeled person. I, I do have my moments uh, where I, I let the pressure get the best of me, um, but um, not, in, not in moments like this. Uh, this is a time where you have to be, uh, you know, your A-game. So um, I, I don't know that I have a good answer for that. That's just, um, you know, one of those personality things that you have to kind of check yourself before you take on a role like this. Uh, do you mind going to the previous slide so people can look at the assessment information? You're asking a few questions about that. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, another question is, how do you keep yourself mentally healthy, especially after going through these high stress situations? Um, I, I have pretty good family support. Um, I, I talk to mentors. I, uh, I would highly encourage you all to get a mentor that you trust uh, to talk over things like this. Um, we, we debrief as a, a team uh, after a lot of calls like this, and there's a lot of uh, benefit to uh, debriefing. Uh, critical Incident Stress Management, CISM, is a specialized type of debriefing, and there's been some literature kind of debunking the utility of that. Um, I still think it has a, a role if done correctly. Um, so I, I think the, the key is you have to know your team uh, when you're around them. You have to know who's struggling um, and be, not be afraid to approach them and say, you know, hey, I, I see you're struggling with this or hey, you know, the other night that, that was really tense. Um, you know, you want to talk about it and, um, you know, you just you keep at it. Perfect. Um, so this was a really popular question. Um, in regards to the Brenna Taylor case and others like it, from your ro role as a SWAT physician, can you discern a way that the outcome could have been avoided? Are medical professionals in your position able to influence those situations to prevent them from happening? Yeah, you know, that, that was a unique uh, situation. That was, um, that was down in Houston. That's what they call a no-knock warrant. Um, there were some things that did not go well on that call at all. Um, I, I don't want to speak for, you know, some of the nuances of what happened in the initial few seconds of that, but yeah, Brianna was not the target in that, that case. It was actually her boyfriend, if I remember right. Um, the, uh, I think where that went wrong is they, they were firing blindly into an area that they could not see their targets. Uh, Brianna got caught in the crossfire of way too many bullets flying back and forth. Um, and a no-knock warrant where you, you may not have had all the information and the intel that you needed um, and blindly firing, uh, I, I don't think you see things like that happen uh, hardly at all. And um, there were a lot of repercussions that came from that. Um, Harris County is not doing no-knock warrants again uh, anymore. They, they shut that down uh, for that reason. So I think they looked internally at their own processes and decided uh, we got to be better than this. Um, that, was, um, that was not good at all. And, and I, uh, I don't want to say it can't happen to us, but I'm going to say that we're – we're better than that. We're better trained than that. Uh, we don't fire blindly. Uh, well, on that second case, for example, we were met by a barrage of bullets when we breached that door. We didn't return a single shot. We couldn't see what we were shooting. We, there's kids in the house. Where, where would we fire at? That's, mm -mm, we don't do that. What if you wanted to switch your subspecialty? Do you choose a subspecialty through a fellowship after your EM residency? And would you have to redo a fellowship if you desire to change it? Yeah, most of the time you um, do a fellowship to get subspecialty trained. And if you want to switch, it just depends on whether that subspecialty is um, something like uh, cardiology, for example. You do an internal medicine residency, then you do a cardiology fellowship and you're a cardiologist. If you want to switch and be a nephrologist, uh, you got to do a different fellowship. 
if I want to become a toxicologist now, I have to go do a two year fellowship in toxicology. But if I want to be a disaster medicine doctor, I don't necessarily have to go do a fellowship. Um, it's not a board certification out of it. I can, I can just kind of learn that as I go and uh, do those, uh, that training along the side with experts and stuff like that. So it just depends on what the, the switch is too. But why would I want to switch? That's a silly yeah. question. This is fun. Yeah. Uh, Brandon, this is Fowler. Um, there was a question that came up that how do y'all uh, handle your shifts? Because you have to do shift work in the ER where you're assigned to it. Is there another physician, another tactical medicine doc covering when you're in the ER and not available? Yeah, so um, excluding Dr. Mechry, who just started last week, the five of us, at uh, any given moment, we have a text thread going of, hey, I'm at work, hey, I'm out of town, you know, hey, I'm you know, going to a movie with the wife or something like that. And um, at any given moment, there's one or more of us that are able and willing to cover uh, for each other. But yeah, there's always someone covering 24-7. Do you have Brandon, do you, Brandon, do you think your uh, <clears throat> career as an emergency physician prepared you for all that you might see in a SWAT environment? I mean, obviously, you work the critical area, pods L and M in the critical area, and you would see gunshot wounds and so forth. Are there things that emergency medicine might not have prepared you for? And Marin, that'll be my last question. No, it's all good. You know, maybe uh, like just any old run-of-the-mill emergency medicine training program, you might be able to say, sure, yeah, there's probably a few things that I would not know how to do, but um, I, I trained at Parkland. It's, it is uh, the busiest emergency department in the entire country. We've seen uh, anything and everything. I, I, I don't know that um, I can't think of anything that I've seen in the field as a, either an EMS doc or a tactical EMS doc that... Um, I was not already prepared to treat by virtue of training at Parkland. And I say that and I will get a call tonight and I'll have something new for the first time. And I'll tell you all about it next week because then I just jinxed myself. Uh, is there any room for advancement in this job? Uh, like, can you be promoted to working for the CIA or the FBI? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Eastman, he was a, um, a trauma critical care uh, surgery trained physician. He did an EMS fellowship, uh, you know, about 15, 16 years ago, like I said, and worked at Parkland with us. And now he has advanced his career where he's the highest ranking physician in the Department of Homeland Security over weapons of mass destruction. So he is a um, he's a federal police officer now. He is a um, um, U.S. Marshal as well. Um, he, he still does trauma surgery, I think probably like two or three call shifts a month just to keep his skills up. Um, but he is a federal law enforcement officer. His training has put him in a position where uh, he gets to try to influence the uh, public health decisions across our entire country. You don't hear about him much because he's civilian employed. He's not appointed. Uh, how different are the duties that physician assistants have to uphold in tactical and military medicine as compared to civilian physician assistants? Um, it'd be the same as um, if uh, Dr. Fowler, who's a fantastic ER doctor, wanted to go out and do tactical medicine. Um, he would just have to uh, learn the operations, special weapons and, and things like that uh, to be able to be functional and useful in the field. Um, the same way that a PA who is very skilled in the ER uh, wants to go out and do tactical medicine, you just, you find a team, uh, you say, hey, I'd like to be your uh, tactical medicine provider or your tactical EMS provider. Um, you know, do y'all mind? Can I start joining on training with you guys? Do you have any SWAT schools that I can attend? Um, it's just uh, approaching them and being curious and asking. Um, now, the, the other side of that is what I do as a physician for the SWAT team, you don't need a physician to do that. Um, a PA can do that, a paramedic can do that with just an associate's degree. It's more about the skill set of what you can do with your hands and quick thinking and stuff. It's not like I'm out there doing differential diagnosis for this bullet wound in this chest. 
um, a, a paramedic can treat that just as easily as uh, you know double board certified ER doc can. Uh, has COVID-19 impacted roles in the team and the way warrants are executed? Yes, uh, we do our pre-briefing in uh, separate sections now. Uh, we physically distance in the briefing room. We just can't do it on the actual operation. Uh, obviously, we wear masks uh, when we are um, in the briefing room. The gym is closed. The guys can't get in the gym, and you think that's the worst thing that ever happened to them. Uh, they can't go lift their weights uh, right now because of COVID. Um, so that's pretty tragic for them. Um, how do you get involved in working as a professional team uh, physician? Um, in my case uh, here, we have a great um, fellowship train docs that do it. And when I started my fellowship, they just pulled me on board. But let's say you're the first one to do that. Um, there are every uh, professional team already has a team of physicians assigned to it. It's actually mandated by the NFL and uh, NHL. The NBA uh, doesn't mandate that there's an emergency doc available, um, but they have to have paramedics in every arena that they play in. So um, if you you work in a, an urban area with professional sports teams, you can um, go to the um, uh, team itself and ask about uh, who provides their medical support. And it's usually a private group somewhere, orthopedic, family medicine, sports med, PM&R, um, you know, plastic surgeons, ENTs, they, they have every specialist known uh, to them. As the hockey doc, I'm, I'm there only as the airway and cardiac arrest doc. So if, literally if somebody tries to die, that's all I do. Um, I, don't, I don't sew up, uh, you know, lacerations or anything like that. I just, it's bone, but I'm just there in case somebody tries to die, which luckily they, they don't. Uh, so this question is both for Dr. Murphy and Dr. Fowler. How did you get involved with medical education? Which subset of students, med students, residents, fellows, et cetera, do you most enjoy teaching? Um, Brandon, you go first. Oh, uh, well, it was uh, something I decided in residency. I was on the fence about uh, after finishing all my training, was I gonna go work in the community or not? And as a uh, upper level resident, a senior resident, I found that I really uh, enjoyed teaching the interns and the uh, junior residents. I love when med students came and uh, hang, hung, hung out with me and being able to teach them uh, medicine. Um, and then our third year of residency, we go rotate in all these different community hospitals. And I go have a really cool case and you know, I did all these cool procedures and found this thing and fixed it. And then I wanted to go talk to somebody about it. And uh, I'm like, hey man, I had this cool case. And they'll cut me off right there and be like, so go see another patient. And I was like, yeah, this isn't for me. Like, I really like talking about cases and teaching them. So it was a pretty easy decision for me to stay in academics and medical education. And I will comment. Um, I, I started practicing medicine 43 years ago, and I have always been involved in medical education the entire time. Uh, in 1980, I trained with the first advanced cardiac life support and advanced trauma life support programs. Later, the basic trauma life support for EMS. So there have always been opportunities to be involved with medical education. And then when I left the private practice career in emergency medicine in Georgia, uh, I was hired on at the university here 20 years ago. And of course, a university is all about medical student uh, and resident education as well. I would just, and Brandon, I think you'd probably agree with this. I'm a much better doctor because I'm an educator, you know, because I have to explain things. Uh, as a faculty member, there's no excuse for me not to know the answer to something or at least to say, well, I don't know, but I'll look <laughs> that famous phrase, Brandon and I could say it together, I'll look it up. And that, that's what we do. And I think uh, uh, along the way in our earlier presentations in Merriam, I think you remember that we said that uh, y'all with all the smartphones have no excuse. If there's a fact you need to know, you have to look it up. Merriam? 100%, yeah. There's no reason anymore, no flip phones. Um, so another question is, uh, what happens if you don't know where the hostage is located? What type of escalating tools would you be appropriate? Um, so we, we have a few tricks, I guess. Um, a lot of times I saw 
this person or this number of people go in this door and then um, once they're barricaded, most of the time, uh, these are rental properties, we have access to a landlord and we can uh, get a good floor plan and then we just figure out, you know, are there attic spaces, crawl spaces, um, you know, the landlord that usually been in the house, tell us where the furniture is. Um, and uh, there are um, uh, some devices you can use for heat signatures uh, within the home to see where people are located. Um, but a lot of times we don't send humans in, we send robots in. So once we've exhausted our escalated options where we have to get eyes in the house, we'll send a robot in and usually we find them at that point and then we know exactly where we're headed. Is it true that tactical physicians can sometimes be targeted by the opposition so that they are not able to help others that are injured? Yeah. Um, so when I first started uh, with this, Dr. Eastman, he took me out on a, a few calls. I was you know, trying to get my wings about me and, and learn the lay of the land. And I, uh, I, I didn't want to wear police um, uh, logos and gear and words and stuff. So I, I got this patch made that said SWAT medic. And um, boy, he ripped me a new one. He's like, he's like target. They're going to take you out first. So you can't fix the team. So um, all right. There are a lot of people that do identify themselves as SWAT medics. Um, I, I wear uh, police paraphernalia so that you wouldn't be able to pick me out from anyone else on the team. And um, also, um, a lot of times, the um, SWAT medics or uh, tactical physicians are not necessarily in the stack is the, the lingo that we use there. Um, they're in the very back or in the armored vehicle and they come out if they're needed to. So that's another uh, way you can avoid being targeted. And they give us um, unmarked vehicles too. So, um, you know, I don't want to have a, a vehicle that's marked with stripes and then, um, you know, they see me doing that in some neighborhood and then I'm driving down, you know, the road with my family or something later and, and get targeted or sniped. So um, we have unmarked vehicles. Um, for possible psychiatric cases, is SWAT immediately deployed, or is there someone who is licensed to handle those cases on the team? Yeah, DPD is uh, chock full of crisis intervention um, officers who have done um, certification courses. We also have negotiators. Um, but we have we're, one unique thing we have in Dallas um, is called the Right Care Team. Um, it's a combination of uh, a police officer, a Dallas fire rescue paramedic, and a psychiatric social worker, they are deployed. Uh, they are a police element. So if there's a patient having a psychiatric emergency that may be a threat to themselves or others, we deploy the right care team. And the police officer is there for scene safety. The paramedic is there for medical clearance, but the social worker is the hero of the hour when it comes to de-escalating and getting that uh, patient. They're not a suspect, they're a patient. Um, getting them the right resources and the right help. We actually pioneered this a couple years ago and um, with the events over the last um, month or so, uh, there's been a lot of news organizations coming here to Dallas uh, to figure out what we did and how we did it. And now they're actually trying to secure, secure funding to increase that across our entire region here uh, because it, you know, the last thing a patient having a psychiatric emergency needs is a bunch of cops coming with guns drawn um, at that scenario. So uh, we, we try to take good care of them. Uh, Brandon, um, now that you've done this for several years, have you thought about going on like Metzger and Eastman did and becoming a sworn officer or d does your path not take you down that way? No, no, I'm good. Thanks. Um, I am okay with not being a sworn officer on the team. I, um, I have opinions about that. Um, I don't want to ever be put in a situation where as a sworn officer, I would be um, required to uh, eliminate a threat, take someone's life. I, that, that's not what I was called to do. Um, and I don't want to, number one, I don't want to hurt somebody. I'm there to help. Uh, number two, I don't want to stand in front of the medical board and explain why I hurt somebody uh, with a gun when my um, duty is to do no harm. So 
I'm good with just being a, a SWAT doc. And um, the good thing about being on Dallas SWAT team is that they are well-trained, heavily armed, and I've never, not once in all the years, felt like I was uh, uh, being threatened or in a situation where uh, I was in danger. And even if I was, I know the team would have my back uh, with weapons trained, ready to protect me while I care for uh, one of our own or a civilian. So um, I'm good with not being a sworn officer. Uh, Brandon, do you, do you see this as an extension of your care as an emergency physician? You think yourself. You think of yourself as an emergency physician when you're on the scene doing a tactical event, or do you see yourself as something else? More. I mean, you're also a medic. Uh, how do you handle that, by the way? That you're you're a medic and a doctor of physical therapy and a physician. Are there a lot of voices going on in your head at once? <laughs> yeah, um, it is. Uh, I have to remember my place. Uh, you know, I see a patient with back pain in the ER. All of a sudden, my physical therapy hat comes on. Um, now, I feel like I function more as uh, a really good paramedic in the field most of the time. Um, there's not a lot of differential diagnosis or physician-level decision-making that goes on. Um, I think of myself as an uh, uh, advanced paramedic, essentially, in the field. Um, all right, two more questions, and then I got to go put some kids to bed. Sounds good. Um, so somebody was asking if you ever considered another specialty while you were in medical school. No, um, I was that jerk that started medical school day one and knew he wanted to do emergency medicine and EMS. That being said, I enjoyed every single rotation that I did. And I think that is very telling of people who uh, make good ER doctors because in the ER, you have to enjoy every specialty because you're going to see every specialty's patients. So um, I, if I had to pick another specialty, um, I, I really, in the top three, I actually really enjoyed uh, trauma surgery, plastic surgery, and OBGYN, um, surprisingly. Brandon, you ever gonna retire or are they gonna find you stiff and cold in your office one day? I mean, do you, or do you, will you get cynical and burned out or what renews <laughs> you and keeps you coming back? Uh, I'd say the teaching and, and the academics uh, is what uh, keeps me coming back. Um, I will not be doing tactical medicine stuff, uh, you know, into my 60s, uh, maybe not even into my 50s. So um, I, uh, I like teaching. I really like teaching. But no, I'm, I'm going to work until, um, you know, usual uh, age, mid-60s maybe, and then... Um, uh, who knows, travel, see the world, uh, maybe I'll have grandkids by then. Cool. Um, and then I guess final question, uh, what advice would you give to like pre-medical students all age, like high school, college students, or even non-traditional students about how to get experience for this career path or like what to expect? Um, well, if you, obviously there's, uh, once COVID ends, there's shadowing uh, going into the ERs and shadowing uh, these specialties. Um, the, um, you know, if you want to get paid uh, for doing it, you could become a scribe. That's a really good way to get paid and be in the ERs and be, have a front row seat to the, the doctors, uh, the mindset of an EM physician. Um, you know, medical decision making, differential diagnosis, and things like that. So, uh, I, I think some of the best residents that we've had have been scribes in the past. Um, but man, I, I wish COVID would go away so y'all can get out in the field again and um, uh, learn. You know, at the the sides of these doctors who care to teach. Brandon, on behalf of a very grateful group, including the almost 500 people that have been listening that are still online, we had 973 that joined us tonight, which was our biggest crowd ever. We just want to thank you for sharing uh, your experience and uh, your love and your dedication. It means a great deal to the working group that put this together, and it means a great deal to all that were listening. Thank you, everyone. We'll be back online next week. We'll be talking about family medicine, especially from a physician assistant perspective. And so on behalf of uh, Dr. Morchetti and the working group, uh, we wish you all a very good evening. Thank you and good night. Thanks.